Ruskin, Florida, shots rang out in the early morning hours of Thanksgiving 2010. Two men would be killed, four more seriously injured. The killer, dressed in a t-shirt emblazoned with the word sheriff across it, would flee from the scene in a two-tone Chevy minivan. It would be 12 years before the killer would be brought to justice, and the case would be the tale of an ice cream man out for misplaced revenge. Join us as we look into the case of Michael Keatley's pursuit of vigilante justice that led him to outright murder. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Juan and Sergio Guitron, who were slain in the attack, as well as the four other men who still bear the scars of what happened that night. This is Michael Keatley, a fellow who doesn't really look very dangerous, every bit the image of a middle-aged man who once drove an ice cream truck. His cardigan and disabilities were calculated to reinforce the image of a man who could never have committed the crimes he was accused of. And once upon a time, he might well have been that harmless guy, but things changed him. In January of 2010, Keatley was driving his purple ice cream van through a neighborhood in Ruskin, Florida. He made a few stops already, but business had been slow. He said a woman flagged him down as if to make a purchase. He pulled the van over and moved to the back window to see what she would like. It was then that he said two men appeared, broke into the van, and shot him multiple times. Keatley had thrown up his hands to wield off the attackers, but the bullets still managed to shatter the bones in his right hand and forearm, and he had taken rounds to his leg as well. The two men quickly grabbed the money box and fled the scene with the woman. They had managed to rob Keatley of his entire proceeds for the day, just $12. Keatley said he reached for his phone but could not operate it due to the damage to his hand. So he levered himself back into the driver's seat and managed to get the van moving back down the road. Luckily, he came across a woman who was one of his regular customers. He pulled the van over and asked for help. She was able to call for an ambulance and he was taken to a local emergency room. There would be an extensive hospital stay as Keatley recovered from his wounds. Ice cream men are sometimes targeted by armed robbers because of a number of factors. They generally follow a predictable route. They operate in neighborhoods where robbers can emerge and then disappear back into the surrounding area that they're familiar with. And perhaps most importantly, they operate pretty much a cash business. On a busy day, an ice cream truck's till can offer up a couple of thousand dollars in loose, small bills. Police began investigating the robbery and shooting, but they had few leads and turned up no suspects while Keatley tried to put his life back together. Well, he's grateful to be alive after being shot five times. I didn't see it coming. He thought she wanted a cold treat, but what happened next was chilling. She was just smiling, happy as everything was fine. Took two steps back, next thing you know, I got a guy with a gun in my face. Two masked men robbed Keatley of all he had, a couple of books, but they didn't just leave. Just boom, 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 boom. And every time my heart would beat, I'd just see blood just shooting out. Some of Keatley's regular customers helped save his life. Up to there. That's about, uh, that's about as high as I can get it. Keatley's road to recovery will be long, his future uncertain, but he knows one thing. They're absolute scum. He wants this violent gang caught. Just pick up the phone and call, please. Because nobody else should have to go through this. And if they were so brazen to shoot me like this over $12, they're going to just kill anybody. They don't care now. The following months turned up little information and no arrests in the case for the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department, who had jurisdiction for the small community just outside of Tampa, Florida. Rewards were offered through their local Crime Stoppers program, but no one came through with a lead that panned out. Keatley, unable to work during his recovery, was uninsured and his medical bills piled up. 
Throughout the area, donation jars were set up in local convenience stores and businesses. He would eventually hire on David Beckwith, the brother-in-law of one of Keatley's neighbors, and the two men would return to business again with the ice cream van. Something had changed, though, with Keatley. Beckwith, a three-time convicted felon, brought on to work the window of the van while Keatley drove. At least, that's what it was supposed to look like. In truth, Beckwith was there to help provide security and ride shotgun for the van as Keatley went through the neighborhoods looking for the men who had shot him, or at least clues as to who they were. The two would split the profits of the ice cream sales 50-50, something that made Beckwith a pretty good amount of money. Beckwith would say that Keatley provided him with a 45 caliber Glock pistol to keep holstered near the business window in the back of the van. Keatley himself would have two pistols nearby as well, a 380 and a 22 caliber. As a convicted felon, Beckwith was legally barred from owning, possessing, or wielding a firearm. But then again, Keatley wasn't supposed to have one either. Keatley, you see, had gotten into trouble a while before the robbery as well. He was under a court order after an altercation with neighbors of his ex-girlfriend that should have kept him away from firearms as well. He had also been in trouble for threatening a woman who had a competing ice cream truck, threatening to burn her vehicle to the ground if he ever caught her selling ice cream in his territory again. Keatley was not the benevolent ice cream salesman his defense attorneys would eventually paint him as. He was also a very vengeful man. Beckwith would later testify that Keatley was obsessed with finding the men who had shot him. And after he turned up some rumors of a man named Creeper, Keatley became hell-bent on finding and punishing the men, with or without the law on his side. Your testimony is that he was riddled with shots, right? Like bullet shots. That's your statement. That he was riddled with shots. Yeah, you should have seen the van and... It was all bloody still when I saw it. And by your own words, he was, I'm not going to use the ugly word, effed up. Those were your words. Sure. Michael Keatley, okay. in your words, was effed up. Right? Yeah. I'm effed up. Can you tell? We'll let the jury decide that. <clears throat> in fact, Michael Keatley would rarely leave the driver's seat. Rarely during the time that you were working with him. Sounds up fairly accurate. And the financial arrangements, as you said in direct examination, they were pretty generous, right? Uh, yeah, I felt they were generous. And the reason that they were generous is that Michael Keatley could not run that truck without you. That's the, way, that's the reason he gave you 50-50, right? I don't know. Well, you were surprised that he was giving you 50-50, right? Uh, yes. And the reason that he was giving you 50-50 is that he could not operate that business. That's not why I was you. surprised. Is that correct? Couldn't no, operate. No, that's business. not why I was surprised. I was surprised because he's a chintz. Oh, okay. That's why you were surprised. <clears throat> now. You realize, as a convicted felon three times, you cannot possess a firearm. That's like a no-brainer, right? Yep. Okay. And so part of your duties uh, with Mr. Keatley in this ice cream truck, part of your duties is that um, you were going to possess a 45 caliber semi-automatic weapon. That's what you were going to do. His. Did you listen to my question? You were going to possess a 45 caliber. His. Did I ask you whose it was right now? That wasn't the question. My question to you is you were going to possess that as part of your duties on that truck. Yes. You hadn't told him that you were a three-time convicted felon, right? Oh, he already knew that. You know, you because he, yes, I did. Oh, yes, I did. Tell he knew what, it. He knew it before I ever got on that van that I was a convicted. Tell felon. me what date you told him. The day I started working with him. Oh. Keatley Beckwith would tell investigators had every intention of catching the perpetrators 
taking them to the Florida swamps, chaining them to a stump, and, quote, allowing the gators to do what they would do to them, end quote. An ex-girlfriend of Keatley would also testify later on that he was interested in vigilante justice and knew very much what he wanted to do. Actively looking for the people that had shot him. Did he make any statements about thinking that he understands how people take things into their own hands? Oh, And matters yes. into their own hands. He understands why people do that. Yes, 100%. Beckwith would eventually bail out on participating with Keatley in the pursuit of these criminals. He said that as the man tracked down what he thought were leads, taking them into sketchier and sketchier neighborhoods. Finally, he told Beckwith that the two of them would be going to a man's home to interrogate him about the crime. Beckwith said no, and Keatley wouldn't agree. So Beckwith pulled the Glock on him and got out of the van. Beckwith told investigators that he tossed the pistol back into the van and walked away, never having anything else to do with Keatley. Keatley would continue his pursuit, though. Witnesses would later tell investigators that the man would always bring up the crime and let everyone know that he was looking for leads, particularly ones about the man called Creeper. Luciano Alonzo, who works at a restaurant in Waimama, says Keatley was a regular customer there. He heard all about the robbery. He said, that guy didn't even blink. He just shot me. You know, okay. he put his hand and he shot him in his hand. And that's how he got his hand disabled. He would ask if I knew uh, who Cripper was, if, you know, if I could find out where Cripper lived. A friend would later tell investigators how he would get her to drive him through the neighborhood where the robbery happened, often while he was in disguise, so he could write down the license plates of the cars he thought were suspicious. She said she had no idea what he was doing with the license plate numbers. At some point, Keatley had found enough of what he thought was evidence. He'd come to find out the man named Creeper lived on Ocean Mist Court in the Ruskin community. On November the 25th, 2010, at around 2.30 in the morning, Keatley would drive his parents' two-tone 2000 Chevy minivan up to the residence where six men were sitting on a porch playing cards and drinking beer. Keatley emerged from the van and walked up to the porch, moving into the light given off by the single bulb porch light. He was wearing a cap and a t-shirt that read Sheriff when he flashed what appeared to be a badge and was carrying a gun. He told the men to get down on their knees and get out their IDs. He moved behind them and asked which one was Creeper. The men said they didn't know Creeper, although they would later admit to knowing a man who went by that nickname. Keatley then shot Juan and Sergio Guitron from near point-blank range, ending both men's lives instantly. He then turned the pistol on the other men and began firing, wounding each of the four. The four remaining men, Gonzalo Guevara, Daniel Beltran, Richard Cantu, and Ramon Galan, would survive not by the assailant's choice, but either by luck or the work of dedicated emergency personnel who would quickly swarm the scene. He, um, I remember Richard trying to get his ID out, and I looked at him, and that's when I seen him shooting Richard in the head. And was Richard kneeling down at the time? Yes. And what part of the head did he shoot, the man shoot him in? Was it? The, the right side. Okay. What's going through your mind at this time? What the hell is going on? After you saw him shoot Richard Cantu in the head, what happened next? He shot me. Where did, could you feel the bullet impacts? He shot me in my left hand. Because I had my ID out like this. Okay. Did he ever take the ID from you? Do you recall? I don't recall. And after he shot you in the hand, did you feel any more gunshots hit you? Not that I recall. Were you shot more than that one time? Yes, sir. How many total times were you shot, do you recall? Four. Where were you hit? In my left hand, my chest, my torso right here, and then on my lower back. Could you tell if other people were getting shot? I, I'd heard the gunshots and people grunting and screaming. 
Keatley had fled the scene in the minivan long before law enforcement reached the area. He did not know, however, that the man called Creeper lived just two doors down from the location of the shooting. Keatley had gone to the wrong location and had picked the wrong men. None of the men, investigators would later say, had anything to do with the robbery of Michael Keatley. Their investigations also cleared a man called Creeper for any involvement in the initial robbery. It would be two days before Keatley was brought in by the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department for questioning and eventual arrest. People throughout the area were quick to point out how Keatley had been asking around for Creeper and one of the men who had been shot was familiar with what had happened to Keatley, having not just seen the donation jars in local convenience stores, but having donated money to it to help the man out. Shell casings were also littered all over the porch where the shootings had occurred, and the distinctive two-tone colored minivan made it relatively easy to find at the home of Keatley's parents, especially after a local auto painting shop said Keatley had been in there the very next day to see if he could get it repainted. Shell casings for the ammunition from the 45 automatic were also found at Keatley's family farm, some of which would be matched by the forensics teams to the ones that had been used at the scene of the crime as having been fired from the same handgun. The actual pistol, however, could not be located. Keatley would be quickly arrested and charged for two counts of first-degree murder and four counts of attempted murder. Michael Keatley would be denied bail, and this would set up one of the longest incarcerations in the history of the state of Florida prior to a verdict being reached. By the time of sentencing, he would spend 4,449 days in the Hillsborough County Jail, 12 years in a local jail without being convicted of a crime. How could that happen? First, being a capital crime, there are certain procedures that must be followed to ensure a fair trial, and proper representation of the defendant is key. Typically, two defense attorneys are retained. One would be the lead defense in the trial. The second would lead the defense during the sentencing phase, if it should come to that. The two attorneys and their staffs would consult with each other and develop a plan for the defense. They would go over witnesses and evidence to build their case, and that in itself can take quite a bit of time. In Michael Keatley's case, he chose local attorney Paul S. Carr to represent him. Carr's practice mainly dealt with personal injury and dabbled in a few criminal defense cases. Carr, wanting someone with experience in capital crime cases, brought aboard Leanne Gowdy, an experienced criminal trial lawyer from Tampa. The attorneys worked on the case and kept putting it off until 2014, when Gowdy came before the courts and asked that Keatley be declared indigent since he and his family could no longer pay the attorney fees that he had racked up. By this time, records showed that Keatley and his parents had paid out $119,384 to Carr for services rendered and $75,000 to Gowdy. By declaring him indigent, the state would have to pay future bills to the two attorneys or risk them leaving the case and jeopardizing his chances at a fair trial. The courts agreed, and Keatley was declared indigent. In August of 2015, Gowdy would be back before the court asking that a third attorney be allowed to join the case as she had been left to carry most of the workload and had only received minimal assistance from Carr in preparing the case. The Justice Administrative Commission argued against adding a third attorney since Keatley had originally hired the pair of attorneys privately. Judge Samantha Ward agreed, and the request for assistance was denied. Not long afterwards, Keatley came before the court and presented them with a letter from Carr that said Keatley needed to find a replacement lawyer to take Carr's place. The attorney said he had been involved in a vehicle collision and claimed that the injuries from it would make it unfair to Keatley for him to be represented by the man. Carr claimed that he had suffered a level 4 concussion in the wreck, a type of concussion that is seen in professional football players that can lead to mental deterioration and dementia over time. In the letter, he said that he was worried that as time went on, he would be less capable of handling the case effectively. In later jailhouse telephone interviews, the Associated Press reported that Keatley said he had rarely seen Carr over the years. 
Carr, in turn, would not reply to local media requests for comment on the stated injuries or the case. Local newspapers and the Associated Press would later report that the accident report from the accident said that Carr's van was traveling at 25 miles an hour when it collided with another vehicle traveling about 5 miles an hour. Carr had been seen wearing his seatbelts and the airbag had deployed. The officer on the scene reported that Carr only had minor lacerations to his hand and arm after the accident. Carr would, however, sue his auto insurance company 10 months later for lost wages and other damages, receiving in the end about $100,000 from them, the maximum for the uninsured motorist on the policy that he had. Carr did represent a client in a marijuana possession case in court just two days after the collision and, according to the Associated Press, had represented many clients in the years following his dismissal from the Keatley case. Those issues aside, the state of Florida went through a number of changes to its capital crime laws. The U.S. Supreme Court declared that the methodology the state used to determine if a case required the death penalty was unconstitutional. The move immediately converted Keatley's trial to one of life sentences involved. New defenses would need to be crafted in the light of this, and the trial was continued yet again. The following March, the situation once again changed after Florida Governor Rick Scott signed into law a new bill that reinstated Florida's death penalty. Keatley, once again, was staring at the possibility of death row. His attorney, Gowdy, now on her own in the case, pleaded with the courts for additional help. The public defender's office wanted no part of the case and threatened to withdraw from it were it passed down to them. So the courts relented and let Gowdy bring in additional help. And then Keatley muddied the waters just a little bit more. The hunger strike protesting the jail's food menu. Hey, I, I'm just trying to get a piece of fruit. I've been out here for over five years. I haven't had a piece of fruit since I've uh, been in this place. The hunger strike was obviously settled, but it would be 2020 before the case would be brought before a jury. Tried over a number of days, the evidence was presented, the case was argued, and Keatley declined to testify or make any statement in the case. Do you understand that it is your decision and your decision alone as to whether or not you testify in this case? Yes. I strongly suggest, though, that you uh, base that decision on consultation with your attorneys. So I want to ask you if you've had sufficient time to discuss your decision with your attorneys. I have. Have you made a decision? Yes, I have. What is that decision? Uh, I'm not going to testify. In an unconventional tactic, the defense chose not to make closing arguments to the jury. On the second day of deliberations, the jury came back, unable to reach a decision. They were stuck at a vote count of 10 to 2, and a mistrial was declared. And then the COVID pandemic hit. It would be 2023 before the case would come back to court and a jury would sit through testimonies and evidence again. Mr. Keatley is present at um, Falkenberg Road Jail. Get set for trial in October, if I remember correctly. And I said, absolutely, under no circumstances are we continuing or moving it. The trial moved into swing and Keatley was brought back in. He was no longer the 39-year-old man, still robust as he was back then. Now, a middle-aged man, bent, grayed, and worn down from the years of waiting in jail, or perhaps he was just very practiced by the time at appearing so. In the end, this time, the jury would be able to reach a unanimous decision in the case. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one, victim, Victor Sergio Petron. The defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. As to count two, victim Juan Petron. A, the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. The years of waiting had finally ended for the families as the judge discussed the verdicts and asked the defense team if they wanted to survey the jurors on each of their votes. Michael Keatley looked on. It's hard to tell whether he was bothered by the outcome or that he was bothered that the delays had finally run out. His expression was one of disbelief. Sentencing would come later, and at that phase, some of the wounded in the event a dozen years earlier would speak in court. How could someone do 
such a heinous crime to six innocent men. You know, it's it's hard to go through this 12 years um, to finally get justice for our family. Um, I, I, it's it's you know the physical damage is always going to be there. With my own brother Richard Cantu, he has the physical damage. I see it every day. It's hard to see that. You know, um, the the emotional damage is always going to be there. You know, with 12 years we've been waiting for this to, to come to to where we're at now, and it's you know for my aunt Boss, she, you know her two kids were taken away from her at such a young age. You know they, you know I went to school with them, and I I absolutely loved my cousins. You know to see to see this happen to that's it's it's unbearable, and I I don't you know it's. Even for the, the all my love families, the Ramon Galan, like the time that it happened, it just it was a, like unthinkable to have this happen to families and friends. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's a heinous crime out of hate and hatred for whatever reason. And no family should go through this ever. And here we are, twelve years later, finally. Hopefully, getting justice for our family. You were a coward that night. You um, hurt so many people. You hurt this lady losing her two kids. We know what you did that night, and you know what you did that night. You hurt us. You caused so much pain to everyone involved here. And the way you're showing yourself in this courtroom shows the person that you are. They say forgiving people helps you heal, but I can't forgive you. Um, you took two really good people away from this world that were doing the right things in life. And that hurts a lot. I forgive you what you did, because I know it's not you, it's the devil in you. And you should let go of that. You should ask God to forgive you. Cause you ain't escaping none of his wrath. Not even the human's wrath. You just heard. I just, I would just like to tell you to ask God to forgive you. Maybe you can find forgiveness and then live a better life, as to eternal life. So other than that, you're going straight to hell. Lastly, Keatley's own attorney would speak before sentencing was passed. However, he has attorneys and there are appeals. And so we have advised him that he must remain silent. So his lack of communication is based on this process moving forward. Um, he has and he always has maintained um, great sorrow for what's happened in this case, but he, of course, has maintained he is not the one who's done that. Finally, Michael Keatley would hear his fate. Guilty on all six counts, I will sentence him to life in prison on each and every one of the six counts with a minimum mandatory of 25 years in each and every one of the counts. In Florida, life means life because there is no possibility of parole. So, Mr. Keatley, you will, barring any reversal on appeal, spend the rest of your natural life in the Florida Department of Corrections. Barring a successful appeal of the case, Keatley will never be a free man again. He was moved from the local jail to the state penitentiary where he will live out the rest of his days. His revenge was never taken and his rage played out in a deadly case of mistaken identities. Now let's take just a moment and offer your opinion on this case. Where do you think the real blame lies in this case? Does it rest solely on Michael Keatley as the gunman who killed two apparently innocent men and wounded four others? Does it lie on the people who originally robbed and shot him over $12?
Or could it have been the police force that couldn't find the robbers in the first place? Comment below and let us know your thoughts. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video. Comment down below your take on it and please subscribe to the channel. Also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.